You and them woods, men. You and them trees. Shake my head, men. Trees, you see. Trees, you holler. Home, I holler. Listen, me and them woods, men. Me, your dream. Leave them trees alone, men. Trees, twisted thickets of spruce, men. You know twisted thickets, your head, men, them woods. Yet the bog at the center, the muck there, the murk there, you only dream. Skinny legs sunk in swamp, them trees. Them trees, I scratch my chin with them. Dream is what we are, the bog there, me, the murk at the center of what you holler to see, men. Let's start by telling a truth that's too often paved over, ignored, or simply not known. This is indigenous land. I'm speaking both of the place where I write from in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the place where I wish I was at the moment, Tromsø, Norway. Let's take a moment and reflect on the fact that all of Minneapolis and most of what is now southern Minnesota is on unceded Dakota Indian territory. We speak the Dakota people's language when we say Minnesota. But at a larger cultural level, we rarely reflect on that fact, other than to say this land was once theirs. Such a cult move culturally erases the living presence of the Dakota Oyate. That rendering of the indigenous contribution as part of the past was once theirs, denies the vital contributions of indigenous people in the present. This idea that indigenous people were progressed away from as settler states asserted their dominance is treated as fact in national histories and cultures, yet native people continue to speak their languages, practice their ceremonies, and live their stories, despite 500 years of genocidal settler colonial attacks on all of those things. Indigenous languages, ceremonies, and stories emerge from a 10,000 year relationship to the land, at least here in Minnesota. In light of this conference themes concerning truths, facts, and fictions. The truth of a living indigenous presence is often eclipsed in American cultural narratives. Land acknowledgments like this one are meant to reset that narrative. While I wrote much of this presentation while living in Minneapolis, much of the editing and putting together of it is taking place in Duluth, Minnesota. Duluth is on the land of the Anishinaabe people, Anishinaabe Akin. The ASINOR 2020 conference is taking place in Sapmi. I want to acknowledge our Sami hosts there and their ancestral lands for all they share with us. And I want to acknowledge the same of the Dakota and Anishinaabe peoples in the places I live and write from. I honor the Sami, the Dakota, and the Anishinaabe peoples as the caretakers of their respective homelands, past, present, and future. As well as honoring the treaties that recognize the inherent political, cultural, and spiritual sovereignty of indigenous nations and their citizens. When considering questions of truth and post-truth, facts and falsehoods, as this conference asks us to, acknowledging the indigenous presence on and in the lands where we find our homes is a good way to start on the path to finding our way with native literature. My experience with native stories begins in ceremony. Not the actual ceremonies that some of you may participate in or that my Anishinaabe ancestors might have participated in, but the novel ceremony by Leslie Silko. I felt a deep affinity with her native protagonist, Tayo, a young man from the Laguna Pueblo. I felt like I understood him. Really though, I think it's more accurate to say that Silko's book understood me. Reading it in the mid-80s when the threat of a nuclear war was amplified by an out-of-control arms race, I felt completely alienated from the society I lived in. I felt lost, on my own, just like Tayo did in the book. It hurt to feel that way, like there was something wrong with me. You shouldn't be alienated from your society, should you? Near the end of ceremony, Tayo picks up a piece of uranium ore and looks at it. The veins of ore and streaks of color on the stone look to him like mountain ranges and rivers. Holding this tiny world in his hand, he wonders how the dark-spirited destroyers could take such a beautiful thing and turn it into something as destructive as an atomic bomb. He realizes that lost feeling he has is an illusion, and that with it the destroyers have been messing with his head, heart, and spirit. He has always known that this world is as beautiful as that stone, that it's something to love, not fear, something to nurture, not destroy. 
That world understands him, gives him a home. When he realizes that a culture of destruction made him doubt what he knew, that its truths were lies, he begins to heal from the traumas haunting him. His epiphany became my epiphany. Feeling alienated from a culture of destruction, I realized, was a good thing. Tayo understood me. After I read more books and more writers, I realized that native literature understood me. In the theme of this conference, this work of fiction saw the truth in me and woke it up. This, works of, this work of fiction, a lie of a sort, saw who I was becoming. 35 years later, it still understands me. 35 years later, the threat of nuclear conflagration seems less likely, and climate change is now the most imminent threat to the environments that sustain us. 35 years later, and I still believe it's right to feel alienated from a culture of destruction. As long as we live with the hope of transforming it and restoring balance to those sustaining social and natural environments where we and all our relations live. 35 years of reading native literature, writing about it as a scholar, working in it as a creative writer, has led me to the conclusion that native literature is part of this hope, this transformation. Let me tell you a little bit of what I've learned over these past 35 years. I've learned about all the horrific experiences that settler colonial people and their nations have visited on native peoples. I've learned about the devastating effects of smallpox and tuberculosis on native communities. I've learned about the Trail of Tears, the Sandy Lake tragedy, the Dakota exile, and all the hundreds of others of forced removals of native people from their homelands. I've had my heart broken reading stories of native children taken to boarding school, losing their languages, their cultures, and too often their lives. I've had it broken again up reading about the same children who, when they finally return home, are no longer able to speak directly with their grandparents. In short, I've learned a lot about how the settler colonial nations go about alienating native peoples from their languages and cultures, from their families and communities, and from their homelands. I've also learned to recognize the way this culture of destruction continues to cut at native peoples and communities through media stereotypes, sports mascots, as well as pipeline and mining projects. This culture of destruction is alive and well in the present. I've also learned that this alienation from family and community is part of my own family history. My dad was adopted, his biological father was Anishinaabe, but we didn't know until this until I was almost 30. My experience of native literature is this sort of great intellectual adventure on the one hand, and attempt to make a sense of my own family story on the other. One of my favorite students of the last couple of years is a young Dakota woman named Mashela. And whenever I get too focused on these sorts of losses and fractures, Mashela says something to the effect of, enough with the trauma porn, let's talk about love instead. So another thing I've learned over the years is that while all these horrific things happen and the ramifications continue to resonate down through the generations, we should take Miss Shayla's advice and talk about love. The love of the languages that revitalizes the languages. The love of cultures that teaches the cultures. The love of sovereignty that exercises sovereignty. And most important to me, the love of creative writing of these beautiful stories by Louise Erdrich and Linda Lagarde Grover and Thomas King and Leanne Simpson and Kaiman Ash Pyle and Daniel Heath Justice and Eden Robinson. And you get the point. This list is long, always growing longer. As the Choctaw writer Leanne Howe says, every Indian I meet is writing a story. And as Turtle Mountain Anishinaabe novelist Don Quigley observes, there are all sorts of ways of being native. I take this all to mean that there are many ways of writing a native story and adding to this list of stirring storytellers. The native story I've been writing, our Anishinaabe family story, is one of loss and separation, alienation. In my novel, Stories for a Lost Child, I dramatize this with the story of Fiona, who knows she's native, but doesn't know anything beyond that, not even her tribal affiliation. Her mother tells her nothing. Her, mother, her mom has no relationship with her own father, Fiona's grandpa, but the summer before starting high school, Fiona receives a box from this mystery grandpa. Um, inside the box are stories he's written to help her understand who she might be as an Anishinaabe person, as well as revealing something about who he might be. Though they end up raising more questions than they answer, these stories are an antidote 
to Fiona's alienation from her native identity. They give her some sense of who she might be in relation to her Anishinaabe ancestors. They help her find her way towards something, even if we're not quite sure how that will manifest more fully in her life after the book ends. The stories that her grandfather writes for her are about all sorts of things. Indians in space, boarding schools, missionaries lost in the woods, and homeless people living down by the Mississippi River in Minneapolis. He also writes in the voice of a being that he calls Misabe in numerous pieces. In other dialects of Anishinaabe Moen, this being is named Sabe. One of my favorite writers at the moment is Leanne Simpson. Her story, She Told Him 10,000 Years of Everything, is about Sabe, and in it Simpson writes, Although Sabe appeared to be in her late 30s, she'd been on Earth much longer than that. In the old days, when only the Anishinaabe were here, she had a different name, a kind, gentler, kinder name. Nowhere in the story do we learn this gentler, kinder name, so I'm just going to speculate and wonder if it's the name where we hear where I live, Bhagwa Janini. Those of you who may not have my severely limited skills in Anishinaabe Moen may be wondering what I'm talking about. What's Masabe, or Sabe, or Bhagwa Janini? I've heard these words translated into English as giants or the forest people. In contemporary terms, I've heard it refers to the being we know in the broader culture as Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Bigfoot or Sabe is a crucial cultural figure. Sabe is the spirit of the Anishinaabe grandfather teaching about honesty, a teaching that Simpson, sum, Simpson sums up by saying Sabe walked with the Anishinaabe to teach them about both sides of honesty, the power of being forthcoming with another being and the art of cherishing another's most naked truth. Speaking with that sort of honesty is difficult, as is listening with it. It requires kindness, gentleness, compassion. Like Bigfoot, that sort of honesty is elusive, dreamt of, hoped for, but often difficult to tra track down. There's another part to the teachings about Bigfoot, one that informs and shapes both the Misabe pieces in my novel and in my current book project, which I'm calling Strange Spirits, a Memoir in Monsters. In Edward Benton Benai's Mishoma's book, Bugwa Janini, tells us that the Creator sent me here to guide and care for those who became lost. Simpson elaborates on this theme in her work, telling us that Sabe's job in those old days was like her job now. She looked after people who had gotten lost, both physically and metaphorically. In my book, in the grandfather's stories, Masabe or Bigfoot thinks all of humanity has become lost, detached, alienated from the world as it is. Masabe is so upset that he even breaks from a speaking Anishinaabe Moen and addresses the world in English, even if his grasp of the language might not quite be grammatical. I open this this presentation with the beginning of one of these pieces in Masabe's voice. Now I'll give you the whole piece. You and them woods men, you and them trees, shake my head men. Trees you see, trees you holler. Home, I holler. Listen, me and them woods men, me your dream. Leave them trees alone men, trees, twisted thickets of spruce men. You know twisted thickets men, your head, them woods. Yet the bog at the center, the muck there, the murk there, you only dream. Skinny legs sunken swamp them trees. Them trees, I scratch my chin with them. Dream is what we are, the bog there, me, the murk at the center of what you holler to see, men. Dream step I do, Bigfoot ramble through spook, spruce, through dreams, through muck. Me in the deep spruce there, see me, men. Yet them pictures you make, them show only swamp shadow and murk dream. Proof, you call it. Proof, you holler. You holler it again and keep hollering. Yet men doubt your dream men. Dream men, dream, holler that. Proof is no proof. Listen, them bogfoot swamp steps show me. Yet men, twisted steps sunk in muck are evidence of absence only men. Yet absence points deeper men, under the muck men. Dream deeper. One of the reasons that humanity is lost in Masabe's mind is because of this demand for proof. The l larger society does not understand the notion that Bhagwa Janini is a spirit and that a spirit is real. Members of the larger society want a body to study, 
For them, you prove Bigfoot, not by listening to stories and heeding the teachings there. You prove Bigfoot by killing it, cataloging the contents of its gut, extracting its heart, and sinking its brain in formaldehyde. If you can't kill it and bring in a specimen type, as zoologists might, just might refer to such a carcass, then you collect photos and you make plaster casts of Sabe's footprints, and you offer this evidence as proving the reality of Bigfoot. The reality, the reality you are trying to prove here, as I see it, is that Bigfoot is an object in the world, not the spirit of honesty. A fact, not a truth. Because it seems incapable of cherishing another's most naked truth, as Simpson put it, these quasi-scientific attempts at discovery are doomed to failure. These sorts of researchers just won't listen to the Bigfoot beings, even though they will spend hours out in the dark woods recording their voices. But there is an interesting thing that such researchers do that's relevant to native literature. In the absence of a body and as a supplement to their plaster footprints, they turn to the evidence they find in native stories. They don't listen to, to native stories to other them and declare them exotic, which is generally how we see native stories used in mainstream settings. Instead, they turn to them as knowledge, which is sort of unique in the larger society. That is, these Bigfoot researchers, bent on capturing, capturing a body, are engaged with native literature with native stories as something to learn from. They mine these stories for concrete information, such as the foods the Sabe eat and their social behaviors, information they hope will help them locate a Bigfoot in its native habitat. They are, in other words, using native literature to help them find their way. Only they don't quite get it. They think Bugwud Janiniwug are lost, and the researchers need to find them when it's really the other way around. These native stories in the form of Bigfoot are coming to the researchers because they are lost. These Bigfoot stories are coming to the larger society because it is lost. At least that's the narrative game I'm playing in the Strange Spirits book. With a PhD in American Studies, I come at stories and critical questions with an attention to cultural and historical context. It's not an original observation on my part, but the explosion of Bigfoot interests swept into American culture in the 60s at the same time as the countercultural movements were seeking alternative ways of seeing the world. It also gets warped in with all the other sorts of paranormal fads of the 70s, like UFOs and the Bermuda Triangle. More interesting to me, the explosion in Bigfoot interest also coincides with the upwelling of an environmental movement in the United States. There's a sense here that somehow people in America had become lost, perhaps. A sense that traditional American values had degraded our home environments and some other way of being in the world was necessary. This is also the Red Power era, with all the native cultural revitalization and political resurgence we associate with that, including the rise of written native literature of the sort that Leslie Silko and Leanne Simpson do. And who comes dry, striding down dry creek beds and sloshing through murky swamps at this moment? Bugwa Janini, Bigfoot. They show up in newspapers, tabloids, TV shows, movies, and paperback books. When the internet comes along, they show up on website forums, podcasts, and thousands of YouTube videos. While many notice the Sabe coming, most people in the larger society ask the wrong questions as I see it. From a biological sciences perspective, Researchers ask if Bigfoot is a real animal and debate that. From a cultural studies perspective, uh, researchers link it to traditions of wild men from all around the world and wonder if it is a symbol of some primal human memory of living, living wild. While such questions have their interest, I prefer to place this explosion of interest in the context of native literature, in the context of what we know about Bugwud Janini from native writers and storytellers. I prefer to place them in this context of honesty, kindness, and compassion that Simpson and Benton Benai point out, and in the context of love that my student Michela wants us to talk about. One of the things I love about this Bugwa Janini Bigfoot presence is that it is widely considered false by the larger society, yet this lie is the spirit of honesty in Anishinaabe teachings. In her book, as we have always done, Leanne Simpson talks about how thinking within an Anishinaabe context in academia or in, within any other sort of majority culture spaces shifts the larger society's assumptions and as such is a way to decolonize those spaces. 
Decolonizing requires truth-telling about the costs and consequences of settler colonialism on indigenous peoples, their nations, and their lived environments. Of bringing the absences fostered by settler colonialism to light, much as we try to do with the sort of land acknowledgement that I opened with. It is a process of speaking honestly, which sends us back to Simpson's words about being forthcoming with another being, as well as cherishing another's most, another being's most naked truth. In the decolonizing process, when indigenous peoples speak the native truth, the naked truth of their experience, it is not open to denial or cross-examination. In reflecting on their power of honesty, Bhagwa Janini says if we are truly honest and we truly want to stop know, not knowing the truth of settler colonial misrepresentation of indigenous experience, we must cherish that naked truth as it is shared with us. Such honesty, cherishing it, is one of the keys to the transformational project of the decolonizing process. What I want to do for the rest of my time is think about those questions I raised about being lost and about Bigfoot by telling you stories about a presence, a mystery, that many people regard as wholly fictional. Instead of asking the skeptical questions about the material reality of Bhagwa Janiniwag, I want to listen to the stories with that second part of honesty that Simpson mentioned. I want to listen honestly and cherish what I hear from within an Anishinaabe context. I've been turning my attention to other forms of literature in this project. I'm not necessarily writing about the great literary writers. I'm looking often at vernacular stories, stories told by people interested in sharing their experiences or their traditional knowledge. Let me share one of these stories with you. It's from an October 2007 edition of the Duluth News Tribune, and it's just a slim two-sentence report that I've expanded in the sort of creative non-fiction way I'm trying out in this project. I call this story, Along the Embankment. The trees of the north woods, white and red pine, bend at the end of her vision as the car speeds down the road. She aims to make Bina on the Leech Lake Anishinaabe Nation before too long. Bina is home. The, pre the trees press up against the road, keep her car focused forward, moving towards something in Bina, but the story doesn't make it clear why she's heading there. Maybe she's heading to an ailing grandparent or towards ceremony. Perhaps she's been away from her community for a year or a decade or a lifetime and is seeking to renew connections she'd neglected for too long, even if, she may, even if she's maybe only really been gone three months. She's moving towards something in Bina is all we know for sure. Ahead is a break in the road, that sort of break that barely even registers consciously when we've been on the road for a while, but which still draws the eye. A railroad line crosses the two lanes of the state highway. No bells are ringing, no lights flashing, so she approaches at speed. And again, in that unthinking way we get when on the road, she glances down the tracks and sees him there, standing at the top of the railroad embankment, rising from the stones along the tracks. Really, he towers there, taller than any person she's ever seen, dark hair covering his body. He looks straight into her eyes, his head turning to follow her as she speeds past and she begins to cry. She feels the weight of his gaze as the railroad tracks recede and the trees rise again in the rearview mirror. We don't know whether her tears came in great heaving sobs or as a gentle release of pent-up emotion. The story doesn't go that far, but she will later tell people that she cried because Bhagwa Janini looked into her soul. He took it in as she sped by, saw something valuable nested there, I think, and so the tears came. He saw how real she was. He found her. Donald Sherman, an enrolled member of the Leech Lake Anishinaabe Nation and a Bigfoot researcher, told this story to the newspaper reporter. Sherman explains to the reporter that creators sent the Bigfoot people to the Anishinaabe for many reasons, including as a way to warn people of impending illness. Illness may not just be a physical ailment, I'm supposing, but could also speak to a loss of spiritual balance, that harmony you seek to maintain within as well as with your greater community and with the ancestors that is the key to living Mino Bamadzuin. Mino Bamadzuin is how you say the good life in Anishinaabe Moin, that life of harmony and balance that reflects both spiritual and physical well-being. Sherman also told the reporter that Creator sent the Bigfoot beings to guide and care for the Anishinaabe. Bigfoot teaches us medicine through our medicine man, Sherman said. Note, stories are medicine. At the beginning of the book that found me when I thought I was lost, Leslie Silko's Ceremony, an unnamed narrator tells us that stories are not just entertainment, 
Don't be fooled, he says. They are all we have to fight off illness and death. He goes on to say, with reference to the stories, that there is life here for the people. Stories are medicine for the life of the people, meaning that Bigfoot stories that teach the medicine men their medicine are themselves medicine. I'm trying to understand this Bigfoot trait of guiding and caring, of teaching medicine, as pointing to the sort of abiding compassion that we might call a blessing. It's the sort of compassion that comes without conditions and is weighted with the sort of keen concern someone has for those who may need help. Let me rem remind you that Bhagwa Janini comes to people who have lost their way and sets them on the path home. Knowing this, we can begin to see why that woman may have cried. Maybe she was heading to Bina to be good medicine for an ailing relative. Maybe she was heading back after spending years living an other than attentive or harmonious life. Maybe she felt lost. Maybe she was lost. When he looked into her soul, though, she felt his compassion enter her. There's another kind of literature I'm using in this project, pictographic. Those stories embedded in pictures, often painted on cliff faces or other stone walls. The most iconic image the larger society has of Bigfoot is probably that of Patty, as the female Sasquatch filmed in October 1967 by Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin is known. Breasts clearly visible, she is seen in three quarters pro rear profile striding away from the camera. But at one point in the roughly minute long film, she casts a glance over her shoulder and stares straight into our eyes. Another iconic image is that of Mayak Datat, the hairy man. The hairy man is a pictograph in a rock shelter located on the Tule River Indian Nation in what is now Central California. The hairy man is not alone in this rock shelter. It is a famous pictographic site filled with images of beaver, fro bear, frogs, condors, and eagles. The hairy man is rendered with red, black, and yellow paints. He's about eight and a half feet tall, and his outstretched arms measure nearly six and a half feet across, as big as contemporary stories report Bigfoot as being. The hairy man stands upright on two legs, has a long torso, and his arms are spread open. There are lines coming out of his eyes, which the Yokut people at Tool River identify as tears. The hairy man is sad, according to their origin story, because even though he helped make the first people, when they saw him, they were scared and ran away. According to the origin story, this rock shelter is filled with pictures of all sorts of local animals, because they all drew their pictures on the rock, so the people would remember them. Like the animals, the hairy man drew himself as well. Harry Man was sad because the people were afraid of him, so he drew himself sad, according to the stories. The Harry Man appears as if he's lumbering out of the rock face towards us. His eyes, like Paddy's, like the Bigfoot spotted by that woman on her way to Bina, are fixed on us. Are the, bu are the Bugwud Janiniwug looking at us because they are looking out for us, as Anishinaabe teachings suggest? The Yokuts, though a couple thousand miles away, seem to agree. In a story collected in 1975 at Tool River, elders said that while children were warned that the hairy man might eat them if they wander off, they also said he was good in a way, because he ate the animals that might harm people, and he kept the grizzly bear, mountain lion, wolf, and other large animals away. In other words, he takes care of the people he created. Even if he may threaten, he is also compassionate, just like Bud sense of being simultaneously threatening and compassion. He is not so different from the environments we all make our homes in. So this hairy man lumbers out of the stone face, moving towards us, arms extended. The Yokut at Tool River must think he's reaching out to us because they built their substance abuse center adjacent to the rock sh shelter where the hairy man lives, so that those in need can pray for healing there. Of this healing, the anthropologist Kathy Strain writes, through prayer, Hairy man will appear in a dream and give needed information, be it a traditional medicine or the answer to a question. Many cave art, pictograph, and petroglyph scholars tell us that the stone faces that, that carry these images were likely understood as, by the original artists as a membrane between the physical world and the spiritual one. Despite its solid appearance, these artists understood that stone is permeable. In clefts in the rock in the caves of Europe, you can find half-formed animals emerging from such gaps. Spirit animal, animals being born from other dimensions into our own. 
a record perhaps of an artist's visionary experience. Some rock art scholars speculate that the hands famously stenciled on the stone in sites across the world are not simple statements of I was here or this is mine, as sort of individualist or settler colonial understandings of property might have it. Instead, scholars think those hands are touching the membrane, marks of love perhaps, in acknowledgement of the dimensions within and beyond the stone. Those hands are telling that other world, I know you're there, I can feel you here. They may be expressions of gratitude, or maybe even prayers. Anishinaabe people also understand that stone is a living thing, that it possesses a spirit. One friend told me that there are rocks which are inanimate and stones which are animate. How do you tell the difference, I asked, and he responded, a stone speaks to you, a rock doesn't. The stones in the sweat lodge are respectfully called grandfathers, as they are elders who share their spiritual knowledge when they speak. One of my Bigfoot poems reflects on this fact. It's called Stone Stars. Stone Stars. Feel stone underfoot, men. Feel stone there. Stone accepts no footprint, men. But stone think of men and the passing impression of men. Stone think long, men. Stone think hard. Yes, hard men say, stone is hard. No, no men, no, listen. Stone think hard, but stone is not hard men. Stone is tender, tender in their care of men, men. Tender in their hard thoughts, tender in their long ways. Tender, stone seeks stories overhead men, the stars there. Stone hears stars men, swirling in the long dark. Stars burning through the hard cold distance men, burning their own heat, their own light, until the long dark swallows them and they are turned to unlit distance. Then stone speaks men, to men men, listen. Stone speaks tenderly, slowly, longly. A word takes a week, a sentence a month. Patience men, listen. Men must stop to hear stone. Men must stop. When speaking of stars men, stone becomes star. And when men listen to stone, men become the passing impression of hard, cold distance. Men, unlit stars in the long dark. Stone's slow words are star prints, men. Long impressions left in the swirling path of stars. The hard distance of it unmeasured until stone speaks. Tenderly, stone speaks of unseen stars, men. Stars swirling darkly overhead. Stone speaks their burning thoughts of cold distance, their hard impressions of the long dark. And stone becomes star men. Stone becomes light, becomes heat. Feel stone there, men. Feel them. Listen. Stones are stars swirling underfoot. These understandings of stones as living things or as a membrane between ourselves and spiritual realms makes no sense in a rigid materialist reductionist understanding of Western scientific knowledge. I hereby excuse theoretical physics from this generalization with its, all its wild and weird subatomic quark multiverse speculating. The physical sciences focus on the material world and rock is a very hard material. One whose chemical composition can be parsed, whose age can be measured, whose origins in the seas or in the crucible of the earth can be reconstructed. Rock can be crushed and ores extracted. It can be made useful to humans in all manners of ways in this materialist way of seeing and understanding the world. By contrast, in those communities where stone is a membrane between our world and the ones of the spirit, where stone is understood as a living being, we can find a differing context for understanding the Bigfoot people. In Anishinaabe Moen, this context is called Manadu. The con connotations of the word Manado are many, though the prevailing definition is spirit. The great Anishinaabe scholar Basil Johnston tells us that Manado might also refer to what he calls a deity, or maybe that sort of mystical sort of feeling that comes over you in certain places or at certain times. He also says that it is an essence that makes a thing what it is, but in the end he says it is perhaps best understood as a mystery. From a modern empirical perspective, a mystery is usually regarded as a problem to be solved, a Bigfoot to be proved. In the Manadu sense of the word, as I see it, a mystery is not a problem to be solved. It is a presence, not a problem. Manadu is the mystery behind the world and within the world. It is ineffable, in the words of the cult Anishinaabe cultural educator James Vukulich.
It may be incapable of being captured in word, and so is a true unknown. We know it exists, but not what it is. It is part of that reality from beyond the physical dimension where we live our day-to-day -day lives. Manadu, the presence, lets us know that the physical world is only one facet of our experience. Manadu is beyond the reach of human understanding. Our reason and logic are too limited to grasp what is going on in the unseen realities surrounding us. Though at times we may see a being emerging from the stone face of a rock shelter, or a hulking figure standing along a railroad embankment. Mysteries like these may never be fully known, but they can be meditated upon, prayed with, written about, and thanked. Our engagement with them may lead to epiphanies and self-understanding. The spirit and mystery is at the heart of native literature as I see and teach it. Ink forming words on paper is the physical reality of a book. Paint forming the hairy man on the stone wall of that rock shelter is the physical reality of that image. Breath forming words of what that woman saw along the railroad tracks is the physical reality, at least in part, of Bhagwa Janini. Like those who dream of obtaining a Bigfoot carcass they can study, we can catalog the contents of the book or do a chemical analysis of the paint on that stone wall. But if we reduce stories to information, we likely miss the real importance of what we're studying. Facts obscure the truth. I do not speak Anishinaabe Moen at all well. I recognize words and I know some simple conjugations, and I try to piece things together, but I'm not at all confident that what I'm about to say is correct. But even if it's not, here goes. DNA is a sinuan. It is, of so sto it is of stone. DNA, like stone, is made of carbon. It is carbon-based. It is of stone, a sinuan. As the Anishinaabe writer Gerald Visner said, DNA is the story in our blood. And some elders will tell you that even one drop of blood carries that Anishinaabe story inside of you. Some stones are grandfathers and will speak to you, offering stories and teachings. My DNA is such a stone a gift from a never-known grandfather, and it speaks to me in the voice of Bhagwa Janini. That woman speeding down the highway didn't expect to see Bhagwa Janini among the stones along the railroad tracks. We don't know if she was road-weary or perhaps in some state of heightened emotion as she approached Bina. But when she saw him, his gaze reached into her and touched something that startled her to tears. He offered her a striking moment of epiphany, an insight that belongs to her alone. It's a story of compassion and hope as I see it. He reached out to her with his vision. In short, what rises from the page, emerges from the stone, and stands along the railroad tracks is something more than physical. Something rises from the page, emerges from the stone wall, or takes shape and breath that makes the story move in us, sometimes to tears or laughter, sometimes to disbelief. But at other times it rises in to insight into the lives of others or ourselves. For me, native literature has been like Bhagwa Janini. It found me when I was lost. My speeding car has no wheels, my country highway has no railroad crossing, and I have no route to Bina. But Sabe still found me, tracking me for years upon years, leading me to native literature, to the voices of Anishinaabe people, and to him. Sushoka Duta is a friend and colleague of mine. He teaches Dakota language, but he also likes to challenge me a little bit at times. One time he asked me if I ever taught traditional literature in my classes. You all know how it is when someone asks you an unexpected question and five minutes, five hours, five days later you come up with the perfect response. Well on this one occasion I, had the perf I came up with the perfect response right on the spot and it helped me realize something about my relationship with native literature. Because I lacked the depth of cultural knowledge and experience to do it justice, I told him that I rarely teach tr traditional stories. But, and this was my perfect response, I told him that I teach contemporary literature as if it were traditional. I was pretty pleased with that response. With it, did I mean that contemporary native literature is a substitute for traditional stories? No. Did I mean native literature is the equivalent of traditional stories? No. I meant that like traditional stories, I regard contemporary native literature as offering teachings, not just telling tales. It offers teachings about how Native people represent their experience as survivors of history, loss, and physical and emotional assault, assaults too numerous to mention here. It offers teachings about how Native people represent their experience of familial love, romantic love, 
love of place and decolonial love. It offers teaching that, teachings that counter the larger society's efforts to silence and erase indigenous experience. It offers teachings to Native people looking for ways to write or narrate their own experiences. And it offers teachings to non-Natives about how to understand the complex challenges and complicated beauty of all the many ways of being Indigenous. It offers insights as to how we ought to live in the places Native people share with us. It offers insight into what it means to live as a good relative to our communities, to our Native and non-Native neighbors, and that includes our plant, animal, and water relatives. In short, it teaches us how to relate to the places we live within, the land we acknowledge with our words, our breath becoming the handprints stenciled on a rock wall. <laughs>